Hey guys, welcome to the next video in this channel. Today, I'm gonna to tell you a small story. Back in 2015, 2016, when I came back to Mexico and started my little business over here, I was trying to come up with a like, a, like something, a prop or something that my students could do in order to learn Maya, in order to learn ZBrush, how to do proper UVs, how to do uh, texturing and all that stuff. And I didn't want to do a simple sphere or a simple box. So after doing a little bit of research, I found the barrel. The barrel is a prop that has been used a lot of times, and it's a really, really good way to learn a lot of basic things about 3D. So ever since then, the barrel has become kind of like a, my, my staple exercise. And every single time I start a new software, I teach my students how to do a barrel inside of that software or using the techniques for that specific software. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing today. Today, I'm going to show you how to bring this little barrel right here to life using photogrammetry inside of Substance 3D Sampler. This is the final result. We're inside of Marmoset right now, which is a real-time rendering. And as you can see, we get a really, really, really nice result. Yes, this is not optimized. It has quite a bit of, uh, like, a lot of faces. I believe I can show you the wireframe here. It's not super, super optimized, but it's it's quite good. Like for just a very basic asset, it's quite, quite good. And the cool thing about this is that uh, if this was a game, for instance, we could have multiple of these guys and you can see the textures look really, really, really good. So uh, photogrammetry is one of those things that has been really powerful in the last couple of years. A lot of studios are using it nowadays. And I do believe that if you're going to be a modeler artist or a character artist or any kind of uh, like 3D artist, knowing about photogrammetry and how to uh, implement it in your pipeline is going to give you a huge, huge boost in your skills. So I'm going to show you how to do that after this very brief Skillshare promotional. Hey guys, Abraham here. I just wanted to remind you guys that we upload all of our courses to Skillshare. Skillshare is this amazing site where you can access a ton of different content to learn, improve, and grow as an artist. We have all of our courses available to watch and learn from right now in Skillshare. You can check the description down here. And Skillshare is offering one free month trial to their premium membership. With this membership, you're gonna be able to access all of our courses and watch and learn all of the amazing things that we cover with all of the softwares. So what are you waiting for? Check Skillshare down here below. There we go. So we're inside of 3D Sampler 4.0, and this is a like at the time of this recording, this update happened two days ago. So there's not a lot of new information. Things will be improving and will be changing as uh, this things uh, keep on going. And the, but right now we have, as you can see here, this is a new project, and we have this 3D objects beta. So I'm gonna click here. I'm gonna create a new 3D object, and it's gonna tell me to import my data set. Your data set are of course all of the pictures that you took of whatever object you wanna use. In this case, I wanna use this little barrel right here. Um, the images should be in JPEG, Targa, PNGs, like normal files. I made the mistake of taking them with an, an, uh, was it an iPhone. I think it was an iPhone, so I had to convert the images. Make sure they're in JPEG. It's easier, Targa's, um, because it's, it's the way that this uh, software works. Now, once you import your images, you're going to get this. You might get this thing called photo groups. And photo groups are like a very basic way in which Substance Sampler divides the groups of photos thinking that they belong to the same object. So as you can see here, it took like, uh, I think 18 photos into one, and then the next uh, photo group, which is this one, has 81 photos. So this is the set that we're gonna be using. We're gonna be using photo group number, um, number two. Now, before we just hit submit, which you could, and it's gonna give you a nice result, but before we do that, I'm actually gonna go to masks, and I'm gonna generate a new batch of masks. What this will do is it will go to each individual image and it will create a black and white image using AI uh, technology to find out what the object is that you're looking for and it will generate the masks that's gonna make your 3D reconstruction a lot cleaner. Because if you don't use masks, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get information from all over the room, especially if you're not in a control environment. You're gonna get, for instance, this back table right here, the walls, the windows, and we don't want that. We only want the little barrel. So that's why we're focusing on that specific object and that's why we generate. Right. To check your mask, you can go here to the image, and as you can see, it's now linked to a mask. This is a temporary file. We can just click this one right here and look at that. We got a very, very nice mask right there. Now, the generation of the batch masks is relatively fast. As you can see, it's almost done. Um, it's like three quarters of the way. But after we do this, after the masks are done and I hit submit, that's when things are going to be a little bit slower. 
With this kind of technologies, since there's a lot of processing things that needs to happen, make sure you have enough space and make sure you have enough like computer power to do so. If you're trying this on a very old computer, you might be struggling. Actually, the recommended settings are a graphics card that has at least, I believe, six gigabytes of graphics memory, at least 12 gigabytes of RAM. Like you do need a, a little bit of a beefy computer, uh, but it should be done. It, it could it should, you should be able to do it uh, regardless. So now I'm gonna hit submit. I'm gonna say high precision and default on the photo ordering. And this is where the actual processing is gonna begin. I'm gonna pause the, real, the video real quick. It's just gonna be a quick jump for you. And, and in the meantime, what the, um, well, yeah, this is just, it's just gonna be a quick pause. I'll, I'll be right back. I was gonna say that on my computer, uh, I've done this a couple of times. I've actually recorded this like three or four times because it was crashing. Well, not crashing, I was having issues with the recording, but it, it usually takes about five minutes, three, four minutes, depending again on the complexity of the object, depends on the amount of images that you have on the quality of the images. Just be patient and wait for the, wait for the whole process to, to finish. Uh, it, there's not gonna be any like window or something. It's just gonna straight it go straight to the mesh reconstruction, okay? You're not gonna get any sort of like a, a check mark or, or anything. There we go. So as you can see, we finished the processing and it's gonna jump straight to the mesh reconstruction, which is gonna give us the point cloud information, which by the way, if you're familiar with other ways to process point cloud information, you could export that specific information out of um, out of a substance sampler for use in other like uh, pipelines. So there we go. As you can see, here's the reconstruction of our little barrel. This is the point cloud. We're not seeing the model just yet. And the first thing I wanna do here, what I wanna do here is I wanna click this little show bounding box icon so that we can scale the bounding box and constrain it to only where the little barrel is. As you can see, it got or it captured a couple of extra points outside of the barrel. And I really don't want that. I wanna keep this thing close, close to the barrel. And I'm even gonna grab the ground plane here and get it right there so that it cuts the barrel right at the border. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have a, a lower cap for this barrel. We would need to find a way to photograph the lower parts of the barrel. Sometimes they like use a like elevated platform or something. I've seen people, for instance, for food, they would poke uh, the object, like imagine a donut, where they would poke the, the donut with a little uh, like long wooden stick. And that way the connection point is very simple and they can just clean it up later on. So there's a lot of ways to do it, but for now we're gonna keep it simple for this one. There we go, and I hit submit. There's gonna be another process, and this is the one that usually takes a little bit longer. Again, it depends on your memory, your system, and everything, but this is when it is actually processing the mesh so that you get something um, that's gonna be working. Okay, now we're gonna be able to see the actual mesh uh, after this process. I'm gonna pause real quick again, wait for this to finish, and I'll show you the result. And here we go. So this one took about uh, 10 minutes, roughly, to um, to process, and this is what we get. Now, uh, here's a little bit of an interesting thing that I found. You could immediately add this to your project. However, this is actually not like prepared with the normal bakes and the height bakes that we need, which uh, like messes up the whole pipeline, really. So even though you don't have to process a new version, I do recommend that you do. Um, and it can be at the same like sort of like amount of faces. You can even go like higher if you want. Like let's try seventy five thousand faces. Uh, I'm not going to move any of the options here, but you're welcome to explore them. There's a couple of like little tweaks and things that you can do. Usually by default you're going to get a really nice result. Again, I'm just doing a very pro uh, like a new process version here with seventy thousand seventy five thousand uh, polygons. Okay, uh, it's pretty much like decimation inside of ZBrush, so you can. Uh, get a specific target count. There we go. Now, again, uh, this is in beta, so it has a couple of issues. I noticed that there's this sort of like weird uh, look on the whole thing. Like it looks like the normals are like messed up. Don't worry. Once you have this, like version one, and you're happy with a base, I'm just gonna say add to project. And I'm gonna hit okay. What's gonna happen is we're gonna get it here. And as you can see, it looks perfectly, perfectly fine. So even though it looked really weird on the on the display, that's what, where I got stuck a, a couple of times uh, while doing this process, uh, it's gonna look fine right here, okay? So look at this. I mean, this is amazing. It looks really, really, really freaking good. And not only that, but if I go over here and I change to 3D and 2D view, I can change the information and there is normal information. Right now, there's very little normal information. Why? Because we don't need as much normal information because the object is quite heavy in its um, in its uh, uh, faces, right? However, we can go to this uh, option right here, open the properties, and let's bring them down here. There we go. And what we can do is we can reprocess this. For instance, if I switch from 75,000 to seven uh, or 7,500 and I hit enter, it's gonna reprocess the whole thing, but now 
with 10 times less the amount of faces that we had, okay? And look at this. This thing, pretty much the same thing, but now there's way more information on the normal map because we're gonna be needing it for everything that we are doing here. So yeah, this is this is great. And you could technically export this as is to any software and you're ready to go. We have normal information. We even have hide information if you wanna do some displacement later. We have ambient occlusion, which is great to get an extra little punch there. And of course the color, which is really, really important. You can change the um, the texture projection here. You can change things as, um, like for instance, here on the normal bake, or where it's advanced general baking. You can add anti-aliasing, so that we can add like a two by two anti-aliasing effect. And uh, this should give us slightly better results. Just be careful with this. It's a slow, so every time you do it, you have to wait a little bit for it to process. And uh, as you can see, the, the UBs yeah, right here, I mean, they're not perfect, but they're not that bad, like we could work with this if we had to do something inside of Photoshop, for instance. And uh, yeah, now I'm gonna show you one thing that's really, really cool, and that is the roughness, because we don't have any roughness channel, right? Uh, unfortunately, photogrammetry cannot capture roughness, but if you have seen any of my series when I talk about uh, textures, roughness can be kind of like inherited from the color, okay? So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna go, let's close, I would like to, Dock this things, but it's not letting me. Let's just dock it right there. There we go. So I'm gonna go here to layers, and what we can do is we can add a, a custom filter. No, not custom filter, sorry, a layer. And there's one called color replace, okay? So oops, it's a switch, channel switch, channel switch. So channel switch is a way in which we can use the information from one channel to affect the information of another channel. So right now, as you can see, this is set to base color and base color. So we're pretty much copying one color to the same layer. What I wanna do is I wanna use the base color and switch this or move this to the roughness channel. Look at that. So now we can use the base color to affect the roughness channel and we can use blending modes such as multiply or overlay and play around with the opacity to modify how this thing is gonna be affecting the overall elements. Uh, if we go now, you can see that we have a roughness channel here. Look at that. We have roughness information that we can use. Now, usually this or this little barrel was a little bit um, way more rougher than I wanted to. So again, no problem like switching these things around and, and finding something that looks a little bit better. Overlay is, is quite nice. Let's try multiply. Multiply is not that bad. And the, what I want here is I want the metal bands, which are the dark ones, to be a little bit rougher than, uh, or a little bit less rough, which means darker than everything else. The wood should be a little bit darker. Now, on top of this, I can add another channel, such as say, uh, levels. It's not levels, it's over here. This brightness and contrast, I'm gonna add this on top. And this brightness and contrast thing, I can say, hey, I only want you to affect the roughness channel. It works very similar to how it would works inside of a substance, for instance. And we can crunch this up, as you can see right there, crunch this down and play around with the values until we find something that gives us a little bit more of an interesting look. Okay. This is something like this, not bad. We can go back to the channel switch and play around with the opacity. Again, to get the general effect of how we want this thing to be. Brightness and contrast, again, only affecting the roughness. And there we go. Now, I'm not a huge, uh, like, I'm, I'm not a, a master user of this 3D sampler. There's people that do a lot more stuff with this, and they, they can generate really, really cool looking elements. Let me see if there's another filter. Like, a levels. You can go here to filters. Let's see what else can we do. Color replace, no. Color temperature, no. But yeah, you can use all of these filters and create like different variations. Some of them are, are more oriented towards like textures, like people who want to do like a, let's try this hue saturation over here. Again, we only want to affect roughness. We can affect like a general lightness or darkness over here. There we go. Something like that. I just want to create like a visual interest on the texture, as you can see right there. Um, I wish we had levels. That would be really, really cool. And I guess we can do it with this thing. There we go. Looks a little bit better. Let's go back to channel switch. 
a little bit there. And that's it. We can generate some interesting and complex things over here. It seems like it's actually... Am I inverted? It kind of looks inverted, doesn't it? Let's do overlay. Uh, no, let's do divide. There we go. Let's do a divide. Let's go brightness and contrast. And it's just this things right here. That's a little bit better. There we go. I want the, at least I want the crevices to look a little bit like less less sharp. Look at that. Now that looks more like like a realistic effect. Now we could do the same thing with metalness. Like I, I don't have a metalness or, or this thing is very rusted, so it's not as shiny as it could be, but we could do like similar filters with metalness to obtain uh, what we want. Finally, the last thing that we need to do to get this into uh, into Marmoset and, and use it if we need to, is to go to this button over here, which is the share button. And let's clear this queue. We're gonna export. On the mesh settings, you're gonna decide the format, which in this case could be FBX. And in this one, you're gonna check for what engine do you want or for what uh, specific preset you want to export. Let's say I wanna do Arnold. I can select which maps I want to export. Um, let's do like, um, again, Unreal Engine 4 here. JPEG, the texture size, you can export this a higher, at a higher uh, like size. Even though we did the bakes at 2K, it's gonna resample them and create like a 4K texture, which is really, really cool. And uh, yeah, once you do that, we are ready to jump into Marmoset. Just connect our texture, our textures like I did right here. By the way, if you don't uh, use Marmoset, I do have a course really, really good about Marmoset, all of the stuff uh, down here on the links as well. But uh, yeah, this is the final result, my friends. Like once you do this, you can get any object scanned from your phone directly into any engine or anything that you might need. So hopefully this whole process has been helpful to you guys. Again, it's really new information. So there might be a couple of things that change in the future. If you're watching this down the line, make sure to check the latest updates on the software. They're usually on the documentation, you're gonna find like anything that changed from the process that I'm showing to the newer processes that you might find. Uh, but it's a game changer, guys. Like this is really, really easy to do. Substance Sampler is free. If you're a student and enrolled in a, like a, a in a, proper university or a, a authorized university. Uh, it has a really cheap subscription. It's just 20 bucks for sampler, designer, and uh, painter. So I do think it's worth it, to be honest. And uh, yeah, you can get this very cool looking results really, really fast. So that's it for this one, guys. Thank you very much for hanging around and I'll see you back on the next couple of days. Make sure to leave a like, share, subscribe. If you like this tip, it could really help the channel to hit uh, 33,000 subscribers. We're really close to our, our goal. So uh, every, every little bit of support helps. Thank you very much, guys. I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye.